All right, uh, next up, uh, we're going to have a bit of a discussion, and we're bringing a policymaker on stage and an activist um, uh, to talk about the relation of those two, right? We just agreed we need to end fossil fuels, but how do we make it happen, both from the perspective of an activist and a policymaker? Excited to uh, welcome on stage Clover Hogan, climate activist and founder and executive director of Force of Nature, and Antoine Pilon, uh, Secretary General for Ecological Planning for the French government. Welcome. All right, um, quick intro, Clover. Um, you've been around the summit for the last couple of days. Some may have already caught you, but for those that don't know you yet, um, uh, you're an activist, you're the founder of Force of Nature. Um, you do a lot of education turning climate anxiety into climate action, which I love as a topic um, in schools and universities. Um, and uh, excited to have you here. Um, how does your work relate to ending fossil fuels? Just a quick, quick intro to that. And what does ending, what does the now and end fossil fuels now mean to you? Tomorrow, when, when, when are we stopping? Oh, all right. Starting with the easy questions. <laughs> Hi, everyone. <laughs> um, my work is as an advocate and as a communicator. I think when we're talking about fossil fuels, we can recognize that there is going to be no livable future if we do not completely end fossil fuel infrastructure. Um, you know, fossil fuels, they have a decades-long history of waging a war against climate action. You know, fossil fuel companies knew as early as the late 60s and early 70s about the climate crisis and about exactly what they were creating. And they then employed a series of tactics to double down on their actions. They started with climate denial. They spent hundreds of millions, if not billions of dollars, discrediting climate scientists uh, in obfuscating the science. They sp then spent uh, lots of money and lots of campaigning on climate delay. It was fossil fuel companies who, in um, incubators and think tanks, created terms like climate change and global warming instead of crisis or heating um, to lull people into a false sense of security and the reassurance that it's not really that bad. And then, you know, some of the more recent tactics are really around deflection. You know, how do we shine the spotlight of accountability away from ourselves and onto everyday people? We saw that with uh, BP, which at the time was British Petroleum, which then in a stroke of greenwashing rebranded to Beyond Petroleum, who in the early 2000s created the carbon footprint calculator. It was fossil fuel companies who created the concept of an individual being responsible for their emissions because it was an ingenious way for them to shine the spotlight away. And just two weeks ago, we had the CEO of ExxonMobil coming out and saying, do you know what? We're not even denying uh, the climate science anymore. But actually, this is not on us. It's not on fossil fuels. The reason we're not solving climate change is because people aren't willing to pay more for green energy. And this is an industry, which was shared in the last session, uh, is subsidized to the tune of $7 trillion every year. The five uh, biggest oil and gas companies in 2022 made 200 billion US dollars. The CEO of ExxonMobil, who said, it's not on us, it's on the individuals, he made over $35 million in one year off the back of the Ukraine war. So my job as an activist is to call out the responsibility of oil and gas and hold them accountable, and critically mobilize everyday people, the people who are squeezed by the cost of living and energy crisis, to take action into our own hands and accept that change is not going to happen from the people who benefit from the system remaining unchanged. Change is going to happen from people power, as it has throughout history, whether it's the civil rights movement, the suffragettes, the Stonewall uprising. It is everyday people who have created change. And so that is my role as an activist. Ah, amazing. Well deserved. Now, you actually got Antoine next to you, who needs to make all this happen in his day job. Uh, so he's the Secretary General for Ecological Planning for the French Prime Minister, uh, coordinating the different policies. And also, your job is to make sure that the government policies match your ecological objectives. Now, I think most countries are not really on track with the Paris Agreement. So 
well, maybe we'll jump into that second, but like, give us a bit of an introduction on what your role actually is and how do you bridge that gap between so much more action needed and then actually implementing stuff. Thank you very much. I'm very happy to be with you today. Uh, so we are a small team uh, just under the Prime Minister, in the Prime Minister Cabinet, and we try to find the way to the how question, how, to, how we do that. Uh, and I think that, of course, we have to find a way to reduce our emissions. But first, I would underline that the subject is not only cutting fossil fuels, but also adaptation to climate change, but also biodiversity, but also managing natural resources. I mean water, I mean land, which is uh, the real, real scarcity of that. Uh, I mean also biomass. Every subject is linked together, and we have to find the solutions dealing with all that. And there are these ecological objectives, but also we need to find a way in order that there is still, I would say, um, a peaceful society. It means finding ways also to give solutions to people and to help uh, each one to get this transition. I mean citizens, I mean companies, I mean local authorities and all that. So we start, our starting point is that we have objectives. In France, for example, uh, Fit for 55 at the European level. And so we have to reach those objectives, cutting emissions and so far. And then we have to, to find the way to manage that to, uh, to, to reach those objectives. So during the last year, we built uh, this ecological planning with uh, civil society companies and all the ministers. And in, for each subject, we find a way to do that. So this planning is the good news is we have a plan, we have a way to reach our objectives. And last year, we managed to reduce 5% of greenhouse gas emissions in France. So this, is, this put us on the good track to, to, to reach uh, minus 55% in, two, in 2030. And of course, this is a starting point. We have to do more, but this is a, a good starting point for that. Uh, maybe my point is that um, we, you spoke a lot about um, reducing production of fossil fuels. Mm. Uh, our mission also is to have solutions to reduce the consumption of fossil fuel. And when I say that, I do not say we only have to first reduce consumption and then reduce production. I mean, we have to do that both at the same time, but not only reduce production, but also reduce consumption. It means finding solutions to uh, switch from uh, thermal cars to electric one, for example. It means finding solution to make uh, so re to, to reduce the quantity of energy consumed, and so far, and so far. Mm. And when we speak about uh, subsidies, because we had these discussions just before, I just want to be clear that there are, I mean, two categories of uh, fossil fuel subsidies. The first one is direct subsidies to companies that produce fossil fuels. I think that can be discussed, but more or less in France, we do not do, we do, not do that anymore. And then there are subsidies for the ones that, that are using these fuels. For example, in Martinique, Guadeloupe, and so far, there are, we can discuss this. We have, uh, can I just, okay, for, so, so, no, I don't think so. So, for example, the huge amount of subsidies that have been given last year has been given to citizens that are using their cars in order to, to, to buy, uh, to, yeah, it means that because, uh, because of the crisis in Ukraine, the price rised up, and then uh, many people could not afford in, uh, in only a year to change the way of uh, yeah. using their cars. So we need to help them a little bit, so it is only the poorest one, but it's a huge amount of money. So there are two, two different categories that is important, I think, to but have in how, mind. How do you make progress when you're patching these short-term things of people needing money, but then subsidizing the fossil fuel industry as a result. Um, oh. This is why we need planning, because things will not happen in a year. So we have to, with our plan, we managed to reduce in 10 years uh, the, an amount of greenhouse gas emissions equivalent to the one we reduced for the last 30 years. So it's a, a big acceleration of that. But for example, we will start from less than 1% of electric cars in 2022 to 15% in 2030. And in our planning, half of the cutting of emissions is done by putting pressure on companies. 55% uh, in putting pressure in uh, national and local authorities, 
and the last 25% is directly citizens. And we manage to, I would say, only go, go to 1% to 15% for electric cars, so not putting too much pressure on citizens, because in the meanwhile, we put a big, a, a big pressure on the reduction for companies. So it means that for the next years, they will do the biggest effort of reduction emissions. Mm. It gives time, I would say, to citizens to be uh, a more uh, sustainable with the pass. Uh, okay. To now avoid I'm, I'm going to ask Clover. You know, Antoine has said he has a great plan and he's on track, so it seems all good, isn't it? Uh, no, what do you think? Ingmar is correct. Uh, he's heckling <laughs> from the front row, but he is right too. Um, I mean, the thing that I think boggles my mind is that countries like France are, and America, for that matter, are subsidizing companies for the green transition, right? They're giving money to companies to invest in renewables. And yet, as we've seen over the past few years, fossil fuel companies are spending more than they ever have in their history, doubling down on fossil fuel infrastructure. And they're not even saying, you know, they are saying the quiet part out loud. They're not trying to disguise their actions anymore. They are intent on being the last companies to extract the last barrels of oil and gas. They're not interested in a green transition. And so it feels like a bit of a farce. And I think, you know, the same defenses have been used by the UK saying, well, we need to support people through the cost of living crisis and the energy transition. You know, in the UK, you have territories and areas like Yorkshire where eight in 10 people are in fuel poverty. In the first half of 2022, eight million people in the UK had to borrow money to afford their energy bills. This is when companies are making record-breaking profits. And you have, you know, the UK government approving projects like Rosebank, right? The largest untapped oil and gas field and approving hundreds of new oil and gas licenses. They were doing this when people are in fuel poverty and when none of that energy is going to see UK households. It's going to see the pockets of politicians who are in bed with the fossil fuel lobby, who are in bed with the fossil fuel corporations. And... Frankly, it's not just the fossil fuel CEOs. It's not just the CEO of ExxonMobil. It's this entire enabling environment around them. It's policymakers. It's also the media. You know, I've seen nothing in the mainstream media in the UK reporting on the profits of these, you know, corporations, of these CEOs. The media is more interested in depicting environmental activists like myself as terrorists, as telling you that we're the issue, the people who are trying to sound the alarm. Just last year, I uh, delivered a TED talk telling a story about a fossil fuel company that tried to move into my town uh, when I was growing up in Australia. And two days before this talk was supposed to be released to the public, they cut it because they said, we're afraid of a defamation lawsuit from the fossil fuel company that you called out in your talk, which for the record was Queensland Energy Resources. We're afraid that we're, they're going to sue us. And so there is a culture of censorship, of silencing activists, of giving platform to fossil fuel companies, of allowing them into the room. It was mentioned that at COP28 last year, there were over 2,400 oil and gas lobbyists, four times more than the year previous. And this is meant to be a neutral negotiation space for policymakers to actually agree on genuine action, on genuine commitments. And so, honestly, it's a bit of a joke if we continue to allow ourselves to believe that fossil fuels have any role in our future and to not acknowledge that they're doing everything in their power to maintain supremacy. Antoine, uh, on that, um, any reaction on that? I think first that we need people like you doing that. And I think this is a huge mobilization we have to do against fossil fuels. I, I mean, that it's totally clear for us that we have to end fossil fuels uh, in order to reach our targets. And this is uh, not possible to do otherwise. And this is true also that this company have huge powers. I would say it's, uh, we see that and you see and you, you can tell it. Then I just say that uh, this is the, not the only thing to do in order to achieve uh, the climate, the, the reducing climate change. Uh, we we have to do that, 
but this is not enough in order to switch and to do all the social mutation we have to do in order to reach our objective. First, because, as I said at the beginning, this is not only uh, there are also biodiversity and also also like uh, land use subjects and so far, and we need to tackle all that. And then I'm, I, uh, I really believe that we have to find solutions so people, companies, and so far are able to do without fossil fuels. And this has to be developed, not only but ending subsidized to fossil fuels companies. And this is our job uh, every day. Uh, to find the solutions, and I think that it needs a lot of money. For example, in France, we invest, uh, public authorities invest uh, 40 billion euros per year in order to find alternatives to uh, fossil fuels, so this is also something important. I'm not saying that everything is fine and uh, we are on track on everything and this is, uh, will be an easy way. That's not my point, because it will be difficult, and we have to fight every day in order, in order to, to reach that. But it means that uh, I think that to, to succeed in that, in that battle, we need to be first together. Everyone has a, a job to do. Uh, uh, of course, states, of course, companies, of course, citizens, and so far, local authorities. And I think that we can manage to uh, do this teamwork, I would say, only if first we have solutions, we build them together, and then we say that, OK, it's not, uh, we are not at the point now, but we have done the first step of results. We can be proud of that and build up that in order to reach the second step and so far each year, another step in order to reach our objectives. And we build a solution like this. This is why we try to, this is what we try to build. Mm. What I will say is that the science doesn't care if we feel proud of ourselves. And by every measure and every metric, we are failing, frankly. Whether you want to look at it from carbon emissions, whether you want to look at it from biodiversity collapse. And while we sit in air-conditioned rooms congratulating ourselves, there are hundreds of millions of people around the world who are already living through the climate crisis. And we are making a choice to sacrifice the lives of the most vulnerable people and communities through our continued inaction. And so I'm less interested in congratulating ourselves for incremental changes in the context of a crisis that demands transformational ones. And it's not to deny that that won't be hard, but I think one of the tools used by the fossil fuel industry is to convince us and confuse us that actually it's just too complicated and there's, there's too much that we need to do. You know, Ingmar spoke to it beautifully earlier. All right, seven trillion, you know, in subsidies and fossil fuels, we need 4.5 trillion uh, for the green transition, for the energy transition. Great, move the money. We know what instruments are needed. We know the pathways to move the money, but we need to be comfortable with being uncomfortable comfortable in calling out those who continue to perpetuate the current system and also look to ourselves and, and hold ourselves accountable as well because there is something that each and every one of us can do and frankly if you're sitting in this room today you have a degree of privilege you have a degree of influence that you can exert and we owe it to ourselves we owe it to future generations and we owe it to those who are most vulnerable who frankly do not get a choice whether they take action or not to do what is the right and just and morally responsible thing. Now, before we wrap up, Antoine, as well, uh, I, I want to um, ask you something is, you know, uh, you know, you're a public servant, uh, but when we speak to politicians as well, sometimes the common complaint, um, rightfully so in many cases, is, you know, um, we don't really admit where we're not doing enough yet and we're not good enough yet. Where would you say is the French government not good enough yet? What do you need to, where do you need to do better in terms of uh, that transition to end fossil fuels? We clearly need to do better in many different subjects, so this is not enough for now. But I would say that there is a good starting point, and then we have, so we have this plan, but this is only the first step, because we have to deliver it. And this is a, a radical plan in order that we manage to change, really to reach 55. So this is, I would say, a big uh, move in our society. And in many things, in public transportation, in reducing also uh, the use of, of uh, of cars and forest issues also, and uh, p reducing uh, pesticides in order to protect biodiversity. In all these fields, there is still a lot to do. But I think that, so 
I do not uh, diminish that. So you have to, we have to do that. We have to accelerate. But my impulse is that we can uh, first, there is, we find a way to do that. So there is a, a path, I would say. This is uh, important for us. Then we put money in order to reach that and to achieve that. And this is something we cannot reach only by moving, I would say, government and local authorities, but also by moving companies and moving citizens. And this is a teamwork that we have to do. And I'm sure that I understand your point, but we need, because this is like a, a real teamwork, we need to, to be together and in order to be together and that we act together, we, we need to be kind of... Uh, conscious of what is, uh, we have to do, but also kind of proud of what we start to do and then to, to build the, 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 the path. Very quick one to each of you. What's the one action that people should take away from this? And also, Antoine, I was going to ask you if France is going to sign up to the Fossil Fuel Non-Proliferation Treaty, if you have any announcements today. I would just like to remind everyone in this room, the job of politicians is to represent you. I know that seems crazy when we look at who is in power today, but their job is to represent the everyday citizen. And we now have a decades long history of policymakers representing the interests of corporations and money. But it is their job <laughs> to protect us, to protect our future. And policymakers need to remember that. And we all need to be politically active. 2024 is a huge election year. We need to go to the polls. We need to run for office. Because, frankly, the people in power do not represent us, and they certainly do not represent the most vulnerable in our society. But we also have to challenge the existing political infrastructure and recognize that three- to four-year election cycles are not fit for purpose to address huge crises like the climate crisis. We need new political instruments like citizens' assemblies, like deliberative democracy. And so I would invite you to not just think about politics as showing up to the polls and feeling really disillusioned by your options when you are asked to choose between a climate change denier and a seasoned procrastinator, but to get active, to get active in your community, because frankly, the people in power are not going to do it for us. We're going to do it for ourselves. Thank you. All right, Antoine, a very quick one from you, and yeah. can we pull out that treaty for you to sign? Or? Now maybe it's the same thing, because there is a, this European election that is going now, and I would say that uh, even that if we, we need to do better, I think that uh, the vote will be very important because there are other forces that I want to uh, really uh, uh, destroy everything we have built now. And I think this is a huge moment for that. So I totally share your point of view on that. Thank you so much. OK, I guess that's a no for now, but we'll hope on the, on the treaty and some you. progress. Thanks to both of you. Thanks so much for uh, being on stage and having this discussion with us. Thank you so much.